Welcome to the Single Mall Strategy Podcast. This is a special episode where we are previewing our first episode from our newest podcast, Developer Dialogue. This is a new podcast show where we will be posting all our upcoming developer interviews. The reason we're doing this is to expand our developer interviews to include you into them. Developer Dialogue will allow you, the fans, to send in questions to developers about the games that you play and even attend a live interview show. We hope you enjoy this introductory episode we're about to play where we feature an incredible interview with Sergio Costa, the product development manager over at Microprose. And be sure to subscribe to our newest show on your favorite podcast app. Links are in the description or you can visit our website at developerdialogue.com. Enjoy. Welcome to Developer Dialogue, a podcast devoted to discussing games with their developers. I'm your host, John, also known as the Strategy War Gamer, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Matt, the Historical Gamer, and Eric Tortuga Power. In our premiere episode, we have a special guest, Sergio Costa, the Product Development Manager over at Microprose. Welcome, everyone, to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. How's everybody doing? I also John. happen to be a Product Development Manager, just saying. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Got a lot of Product that Development Managers here. <laughs> I'll just see myself out. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably want to trade uh, positions, right, Matt? Because uh, Sergio is in charge of uh, how many uh, amazing games that are coming out. Where Where are you, Sergio? Where in the world? I'm in Portugal, uh, near Lisbon, just uh, just outside of Lisbon. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds so, nice. Yeah, sure, we can is... trade places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, this is one is mine. So <laughs> you guys not in quarantine there, right? I think uh I think Portugal and Spain they're kinda like a lot better than we are in the States. Uh kinda. We well things were good until perhaps a week or so here in Portugal. So the lockdown was, was going uh, it was just getting getting better. Things were getting better and the lockdown was going away. But, you know, people being people and just, I think they thought, you know, lockdown is going away. We can go to the streets and, you know, just hug each other and kiss each other and <laughs> spit, <laughs> spit over other people and stuff like that. And things are turning to the worst here. It's not, I'm not, it's not like, you know, it's spread all over the place and the hospitals are full. Although some, some of the hospitals are already having problems. But we were very proudly, you know, doing our thing and being very responsible. And things are just, things are just going uh, south right now. To be honest with you. Oh, is that uh, is the whole company of Micros? Uh, like, are you guys international? So, is this affecting all of you, or are you guys are in different parts? Now we're in different parts of the world. I'm, um, yeah, I'm one of the few guys in Europe. We have guys in the U.S. and Australia and other countries. So we're we just scattered around the world. Yeah, the man who brought it back, he's from Australia, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he is from. Are you able to say roughly how many people like are actually a part of Microprose? Uh, yeah, I would say between fifty to seventy. Oh wow! There's yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, the company is larger than I thought it, it was when I first joined. I thought it was just, you know, half a dozen guys. But uh, over time, I, I started to realize that there's a lot of people working for Microprose. Um, That's actually pretty encouraging. I know, you know, in our yeah. podcast where we talked about it the other day, it, it, some of the announcements weren't super clear. So it almost sounded like it could have been like two guys in a truck or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I wasn't super clear on, on how many people they were, but 50 to 70, that's a pretty big operation right out of the gate. Yeah, it is. It is. It wouldn't be easy to get 70 guys inside a Volkswagen bus. <laughs> <laughs> we tried, but, you know, yeah, we just had to. Yeah, well, um, I, you know, when I first heard about the return of Microprose, I kind of had the same feeling that you guys, uh, that you guys probably had. And I heard, like I said, I heard your last, your podcast about, not your last one, the one before that, about Microprose. And I, I, I related with every, with a lot of things that you guys said on that on that episode, which was, you know, we didn't actually know what was going on. Uh, we didn't actually know who was behind it or, you know, the first thing that I thought, to be honest, when I saw Microprose was coming back, was to think, you know, this is some guy just milking the brand, you know, just grabbing, just, you know, someone just bought the brand and they're going to milk it. 
Uh, but you know, then I started looking into what David Lagetti did and does, and um, I I started talking with him, and I just realized, yeah, well, this this is serious. This is actually serious, and this guy is just one of us. You know, one of the guys that used to play micro prose games back in the old days, and he has this urge, this crave, this you know, this intense will of getting micro prose back into the market as the company it was before. So, yeah, um, I, I was very excited and very surprised when I heard about the size of the company and what, and what Matt David had in what plan for, for the company. Yeah, I mean, that for me, that's really exciting. I know um, I had some reservations, uh, as I think I talked about in our previous podcast. I also had some excitement. I mean, I know, David, he's been involved in a lot of successful ventures previously. I believe he was involved in like the early days of Arma. And obviously that that yeah. turned out very well, um, but still, you know, to your point, anytime you hear something like a, an old classic brand coming back, uh, you know, knowing that there are other game companies that that have you know not uh, fulfilled the promise that you hoped, there, there's a natural little bit of uh, of skepticism, I think. But it's good to hear that that it, it seems like you guys are really going going full bore right at it. Uh, to follow up on that, I'd like to ask, why do you think that David chose? to not just make it own, his own game studio, but why do you think he was interested in uh, acquiring Microprose itself? Yeah, it was, it was what, what I just said. He, he, is very, he was very passionate about Microprose. He's always been very passionate about Microprose. He has the highest respect for the, for the brand and for what the brand did. And I can relate to that because, you know, uh, I grew up playing Microprose games. And when Microprose, well, didn't shut down, but was just, kind of like ghosted and just put on the shelf. Um, I, I was very disappointed because a lot of the best games I ever played in my life, in my life were from Microprose. And the same happened to, to David. And um, he just wants to recapture that spirit. You know, that, that's the thing. The way, I'm, it, I, I'm not trying to advertise Microprose or, you know, trying to sell, out, sell Microprose to you guys. But the way Microprose is working with publishers is very different from what a lot of other companies are doing. And it, it's all in the spirit of what Microprose was. And it's that same spirit that David is trying to get back um, you know, into, into the industry. He, he, he just wants to do as, you know, as, as good of a work as Microprose did back in the days, following that same spirit, bringing the same type of games and giving you that sense of, um, of you know, I would say perhaps a different a, a, a sense of fulfilling when you're playing these games, a sense of progress and being part of something and being part of a story, um, being part of a world of a universe that, you know, developers are creating for you. I think that that is, that is the main thing that made David not just build his own company because he could have, he has other companies, he could have just, you know, Really, is a new brand, but he wants to bring the old microprose, the, the the actual old microprose, back from from the dead and just push it through into the next years. Well, my question is about microprose. I wanted to ask two questions. I usually ask this questions um, every time we bring on a guest to the, uh, to the show. So before we begin, I wanted to ask a little bit more about you. Uh, what was your favorite strategy game growing up, and uh, what kind of inspired you to kind of uh, get into the gaming industry? Oh, strategy! My favorite strategy game. Uh, I I really don't know. I to be honest, I, I didn't play any th th that many strategy games back back in the old days. I was more of a of a flight of a flight simmer. Um, kind of a can you can we can we call civilization a strategy game? <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it, yeah, it would probably be Civilization. It would probably be, it, it was the first the first game of the of, it was the first game of the genre that I ever played. I spent hours playing it on a on a two eight six in the in, in a friend's in a friend uh, in a friend's place. Um, so I would say Civilization really caught my attention and showed me that, you know, it was possible to do games that were very different back then from the action games and from even f some flight sims that were out there. Um, so I would probably say Civilization, yeah. Um, 
and why I wanted to get into gaming industry. I mean, don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it something like, isn't one of you of mankind's dreams <laughs> to play, <laughs> you know, to just, I um, yeah, I mean, come on, guys. What kind of question is that? <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, I, I, I've always wanted to 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 work with in the gaming industry for years, for for several years, and I, I haven't had I haven't haven't actually had the, the chance to do it um, at least professionally uh, until just recently when I when I joined Microprose. I have worked in the gaming industry on different areas before, not professionally, but helping developers and working with the community and whatnot. You guys know I also do other things. I have other projects besides besides working for Microprose, uh, projects related to other kinds of gaming. So I've always been in touch with the gaming uh, market, with the gaming community, but professionally this is the first time. And it's just, it has been a dream of mine since I was uh, a teenager, basically. Um, one of the uh, biggest pieces of news when you guys uh, formally made your announcement uh, was that the, one of the original co-founders of Microprose, uh, Bill Steely, I believe, uh, yeah. was going to be returning to the company. Um, I'm just kind of curious, uh, like, what will his role be at the company? Is it he's going to assume his former role or how involved will he be? Well, Bill, Bill is an advisor. Bill is, has been advising and mentoring and helping David um, getting getting the company back on his feet and uh he is he is a gamer he is also a gamer bill loves to play and not just golf which is something that you know <laughs> he, he, yeah he can go on for hours and hours and uh he just loves it and um he's just you know he's retired and golfing and now he's back helping david with micro pros he's not going to be <clears throat> very directly involved on product development or anything like that, but he will be definitely be involved in providing some input about games and about, you know, he's going to be trying all our games for sure and giving his feedback and just letting us know what it works and what not. So although he won't be involved in developing games per se, you know, he won't be part of a development team or probably on the production team or anything like that. But Bill will be playing games for sure, and Bill will be providing feedback and telling us, you know, what is it that we're doing right and where is it that we are screwing up. And he's very good at telling us where we screwed up. <laughs> so I'm assuming that means Golf 4.0 uh, is coming to a really dynamic campaign on the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, folks are just going to... <laughs> Enjoy your dynamic golf campaign system <laughs> that we have in place, yes. <laughs> and we have a DLC with a lot of different balls with different <laughs> colors. <laughs> oh, that was great. Golf and the DMZ. It's the first time anyone's ever done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> get, get, get some extra balls with our DLC. Yeah, we, we can cut that out, right? <laughs> is, that a, is that a sand trap or a minefield? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> both <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys <laughs> um so uh since you guys made uh, your last announce, uh, announcement um one of the questions I, I guess we all had was um is micros going to be developing games or just being an exclusive publisher or perhaps both yeah, it's both. It's the same that the same thing that old Microprose did. So the Mighty Eighth is uh, is an internal product, and uh, we have we have several other products being developed in parallel as well, both internally and externally. So we're not one of the things that I heard when micro when we announced the games, and it's it. I understand why. It was the fact that you know. All, all the games that we announced, the first three games that you guys talked about on the for, on the on the previous episode of not the previous the other one before of your podcast, was the fact that the three games that we were releasing were not exactly new games, and it, it was it wasn't anything that we were developing internally, uh, which it's correct. It's not it, these are not actually micro pros developed games, but something that other teams are developing, but. We were, we are, and we we were already back then developing the Mighty Eighth, and we are working on other games as well. Um, the thing is, you know, it it it's just too soon to announce any of the other games. Even the Mighty Eighth, 
to be honest with you, we announced the Mighty Earth a bit sooner than we were expecting to, or then, or you know, the sooner than we would probably uh, be announcing on a regular workflow. But I actually asked David and pushed. The, push, the, push David a bit to, well, not push David, but, you know, I just push it, the idea um, a bit so that we could uh, tell all the other guys, all, all the persons, all the people that were checking out the screenshot that we have released earlier about this B-17, I, I thought that we owned them an explanation of why we were releasing those screenshots, but all of a sudden you have three games and none of them are even remotely related to, well, one of them is, well, a couple of them are actually, because they are something that, you know, that are passed on World War II, but they weren't actually related to, to the screenshots. So that that's the reason why we announced the Mind the Eighth, although it's still in a bit of an early stages of development. But yeah, we have, um, like, like I said, we have between 50 to 70 people worldwide, and we are working on several internal games as well. Well, you never have to apologize to me for announcing games early. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> the last three years, half my top five most anticipated lists, I think like one or two of the games end up coming out in the year I say I'm really excited about them for. So, Yeah, but you know, we, we don't actually have that spirit of... Uh, announcing things way too early it's i I don't think it's productive it's good to build the hype it's it's not like we don't understand marketing and hype and anything like that but sometimes it's it's just too early to announce something or you know you don't want you don't want people thinking it's vaporware when it's not out yeah um, however long it takes to to yeah exactly because let's let let's be honest you know uh, every time you want to release a product, you know things will go sideways somehow, and we you'll have to postpone uh, one or two times the, the the actual release of the game. And you know if if you announce a game five years in advance, and then you know before releasing you have to postpone it three or four or five months, you know you are just consuming people. You are just dragging people around in this you know never ending story of. You know, it, oh, we're we're developing. Yo, oh, sorry, we have to postpone it. And I don't think that's productive. I don't think that that's something that actually benefits the community. You know, I, I could, we have we have a double digit list of games that you know are under development, and we are going to be announcing during the next few months. Okay, but you know, it, it yeah, but it would make no sense for us to throw that list at you and having you wait for. God knows how long for these games, right? You know, we, we, we know they are being developed by us or other companies. Some on pre-production, some on production, some, you know, are, are very at very advanced stages, but there, it, it, would, it would mean nothing for the community except that sense of hyping and saying, oh, look, we have 10 or 15 or 20 or 30, I'm exaggerating here with 30, but we have this list of games that we are going to release now and wait 10 years and <laughs> we'll get everything out. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not something we want to do. Well, since we're on the topic of B-17, the Mighty Eighth, because I'm sure that's all on the tip of our tongue, um, I wanted to ask, you recently made this announcement for B-17, the Mighty Eighth, and one of the questions that I had, and I guess uh, a, couple, a couple of us had, is this a sequel to the original game, or is this more of like a reboot? Mm, um, I would say it's, yeah, it's a sequel. It's not. It's not a reboot. Um, we may have something regarding another another version, perhaps more like a reboot, but. Um, this mighty eighth that we announced it, it, it it's a different version it's a, it's a sequel it's a, the it's it's something new it's something that um it follows the same spirit but it's something completely made from scratch completely done from scratch based on what the mighty eighth the original game was so i have a question about for that uh when you say the mighty eighth um is it supposed to be more it sounds like from the from the gameplay description I've seen so far, it's VR, it's, you know, first person mostly. Mm. Um, are we, is there going to be elements of the B-17, the Mighty Eighth 
which was actually the second game, right? There was the 1992, and then there was the 1999. Or I don't, I don't know the exact year, but the later one was Microprose. But then it was like, wait, is this Atari? <laughs> yeah, that was when the brand started to disappear in the in the later days of Microprose. Sorry, I didn't. Mean- no, but the second one was actually the the good one in my opinion because it had the strategic element, which or the tactical um, element, uh, where you got to actually design your mission going mm-hmm. in. I thought that that was really cool. Do you? I mean, is there any? Uh, uh, spoilers on this front i haven't seen anything i don't know can we design our own missions and <laughs> do the formations or, or maybe even dlc <laughs> yeah that's that's the direction we're going through that oh, is the oh, direction great. Oh, that's that very is good. the direction we're going through yeah things can change we are still uh we are still experimenting like i said you know we announced this a bit a bit earlier than we anticipated so we're, we're there, there are things that we are working on there we are still experimenting with and and just you know they are on on the on the game design documents but you know things only things only work when we get them to work and we see that it's it's good and it's productive and it's something that it, it will benefit the game that is the direction that we want to that we want to give the game yes to bring those elements mm-hmm. and to like i said you know just br- and bring the old actual experience inside b17 to be an amazing one with VR, but not you know exclusively with VR. I've I've seen, we tried to say this in the announcement and get people to understand this. This is not VR exclusive, okay. So this is not something that you need to have VR to play. We will have a non-VR version, and also the fact that it's a co-op game doesn't mean that it's exclusively co-op. You can play the single-player game normally. But the thing is, you can get into the aircraft with nine other, nine other friends and just, you know, cause mayhem and havoc <laughs> trying, to, trying to go through the same, you know, pathway inside the B-17 and do races <laughs> inside. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I will say that the VR aspect is, is interesting. I, have, I don't personally own a VR headset, but between this and a couple of other games, uh, another bomber game actually that was announced uh, I don't know if it was announced recently, but I saw it. Uh, and then the, I think there's like a U-boat VR game by another studio in development. Like it, it's one of those things where it's kind of tempting me to to look into get a, getting a VR headset. But it's nice to hear that it wouldn't be required for this game. Because um, for some people, you know, that's certainly a that's a big investment um, plus the yeah. game. You know, for a lot yeah. of people. So the yeah, it is. Since since you mentioned VR, I, I need to ask. So I, when this game comes out, I know what to buy. What VR headset would you recommend for for me and everybody else to buy? What are you guys using in house that I can replicate? <laughs> uh, well, that actually that depends on their budget. Honestly, <laughs> um, <laughs> get you can also you can get a Vario for six thousand euros, but I would probably don't recommend it um for for reg- for gaming unless you 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 have you know the firepower and uh, you have a good computer and have the actually money um but you know s- uh, and well very is a professional model i would probably you know nowadays the choices always fall for me uh, onto two models you know you have the oculus rift s which is a 300 dollar model works nicely it's an advance regarding the previous one um the recent news about you know the the rift go and everything else people are saying that rift s is going to be dropped as well i've heard some rumors i have no idea if that if that's true i don't i don't actually believe it but the rift s is a good investment i think it's the best bank for your money right now and you have the hp reverb which gives you much better resolution, but you need a better computer and it's much more expensive. I think it's like twice the price of the Rift S. So I would, if you have the budget and the computer, I would go with the HP. If not, I would go with the Oculus Rift. Okay. I myself have the Oculus Rift S, although I'm surprised that you didn't mention the index in that. Well, I I personally have no experience with the index. I'm giving you uh, recommendations based on what I have used and tried. Um, I, I never I never I never tried an index, so I'm I'm not comfortable with recommending something I haven't tried it myself. That's fair. Okay. And and going back to B17, I think one of the other cool things that you guys are doing is that you're you're going to be including the B24 because I don't think yeah. I've ever seen a World War II. 
I mean, there might be a World War II flight sim out there that has the B-24, but certainly all the, the, and this is probably the wrong word for a war, but all the romance around, like, the bombing campaign is around the B-17, right? Like, that's the focus in the European campaign that always gets highlighted. And the B-24 was a remarkable aircraft in its own sense, so it's going to be cool to be able to walk around, uh, you know, and, and, and fly that. Uh, because I don't think I've ever I've ever seen that. And the the B twenty four was a very unique aircraft in its own right uh, compared to the B seventeen. So I think that that's a uh, uh, that's something I'm excited to see. Yeah, and it's it. Let me tell you, it's it's not it's not being easy developing the B twenty four because there's there's just not enough resources, imagery, and and you know well mostly imagery of the inside of the aircraft you know our artists are are really struggling to get imagery of a lot of different portions of the aircraft the b17 has been covered extensively and if even then you you can you can find a lot of sources that are not exactly correct and the aircraft were very different from each other you know not just between versions but even within the same versions and then you had something some details like you know the lead aircraft would have the bomb site, and the other aircraft probably wouldn't. So, in you know, in a in a flight formation, you probably have one or two uh, bomb sites. Um, in, 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 it's it's not something that you would see in our on all oral aircraft. Sourcing materials to do the B twenty four is proving to be very hard. Honestly, well, uh, it's, well it's, I applaud you guys for trying because I don't like I said I don't think I've ever seen anyone do it before. Uh, my wife has a relative who actually uh, passed or passed away or lost their life in a B twenty four over Europe. Um, so I think it's I think it's awesome to see that that hopefully will be covered. And yeah. um, it's interesting too, right? Because all the press attention is around the Flying Fortress, but they made way more B twenty fours. So you would you would think there would be some resources out there for it, but. Um, yeah, it's just I, I don't know. I think it's like it's like you said. I I don't I don't think you use the word wrongly. Well, not wrongly, but in, I know again, like I said, it's weird to use that word romance. But that's that's the thing. There's it's not a romance as in the love story, but there's there are romantic stories and there's some romance around World War Two and especially the B seventeen. And, um, you know, even with movies like Memphis Bell and whatnot, the B-17 was brought to the spotlight because it was a great aircraft. And it kind of it kind of made other bombers fade away, especially the B-24. But the B-24 was a part was was a big part of the of the Mighty Eighth. It was part of the of the, the, the fleet of aircraft that that flew over Europe and did all those bombings. So. As part of that history, we want to recreate it and bring it to the game and make it, you know, just make it shine as much as possible and um, not, go, not, not, not to outcast a shadow over the B-17, but we don't want the B-17 to cast a shadow over the, tw- the B-24 as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not being easy. It's not easy getting those images and getting the aircraft to be modeled by our team. But we, it was something that it, it excited us right from the start when you start, you know, when you start thinking about, you know, what if we just added, you know, another bomber? What if we just added the B-24, which was, you know, as much part of the Mighty 8th as the B-17 was? And it was a no-brainer. You know, once, once I, I, don't, I think it was David that, you know, just brought it to the table and it was, it was brilliant. And we were very excited about it. But yeah, but <laughs> now we're we're trying to get the aircraft, bring the aircraft to life, and it's um, fortunately we have some contacts and some people that are managing to help us. But it's not easy; it's not easy sourcing those images. Hmm. I'm kind of curious in the game, watching B17, the Mighty Eight, the uh, gameplay videos, uh, just kind of going over it again. Um, one thing that I really enjoyed is that you can, um, I, f- I forgot that you can get your hands on literally everything in the game. You can get your hands on like uh, pretty much, uh, you know, flying the plane, you know, shooting, uh, you know, uh, all, basically everything and being in the briefing room and, and such. Um, because this game is going to be in VR as well as, you know, you can do it from the um, um, mouse and keyboard, will we be able to kind of like walk freely throughout the the plane and get our hands on well pretty much everything on in the plane that is the goal 
that is the experience. Wow. That's what the game is about. Wow. Honestly, that's what the game is about. And you can do it, like I said before, you can do it with nine other friends inside the aircraft. <laughs> that wow. is the thing, you know. We'll see how long they're friends. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> This is a social experience we're doing. <laughs> we're, you know, we're, our job is to break, break down friendship. Yeah, but... Uh... <laughs> Diplomacy meets B-17s. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, well, you just, yeah, just nailed it. Yeah, it's... Look, there, there's... Here's the thing. There, there are a lot of challenges in doing this, right? Because you, when you start considering what's behind having... Ten guys inside uh, inside a, a sardine can. Um, you have to start making some some choices. You have to start, you know, um, how how do we handle when two players cross each other on the, on a spot of the aircraft where only half a person <laughs> would would actually get into? You know, there are there are some really tight spots in the B seventeen. Have you ever seen how the tail gunner? gets to his position he has to go around the the tail the the, the tail wheel um the tail wheel bay and it's just a cramped space so how do you handle that when two guys are trying to are trying to you know cross each other on spaces like this i'm not saying you know it's not yeah you you probably have if you're not playing with actual friends and you are, you are playing with some guys that you, you met randomly for some reason, you probably find some someone that is just there to ruin the experience of everyone and he will just camp in the middle of a place where no one gets to, you know, gets to pass through. So how do we handle this? Are we going full realism and, you know, the... The, the, the crew the crew's bodies are actually you know you, you can't go, you can't go through them or do you do it more on how a lot of other games out there um, solve it which is you know you can go through other players and so do you, how do you actually move around the aircraft using VR for example uh, there, there, there are a lot of different ways of doing it and I hate most of them personally i just pay them <laughs> right it's just mm, no <laughs> yeah, that's right rough. yeah so we have a lot of design choices to do and we have a lot of, de of design experiences to do and we are doing them and we're we're, we're reaching some interesting um decisions but that is the ultimate goal is for you to be inside the b17 move around it's not just you know you're not just in to click here and click there you are actually going to move around. That's the goal. Anyway, you are actually going to move around the B-17 and get to see all the details. And, you know, if something happens to the aircraft, uh, we, have, we have given an example on the announcement. You know, the aircraft is hit by flak. You have a hole on the fuselage. You have the rudder cables cut off. You will be able to do some repairs. You're not going to repair the hole on the fuselage, of course, right? So like you're not Have going you seen bomber crew. I can't jump out on the wing and, and <laughs> fix it from the outside. Yeah, we're, we're I don't think yeah, I don't think we're going to do that. <laughs> Please excuse us if we don't do that, okay? But uh, I don't think that that's something that we're going to do, but you will be able to do some repairs. You'll be able to uh, interact with portions of the aircraft that are um malfunctioning or you know are broken yeah, and you'll be able to do those a lot of those repairs yourself and try to get the bomber back home safely awesome well i know i'm really excited about that i'm you know i am curious to see how you guys manage the the aspect outside of the flight because uh, i think a lot of co-op games tend to tend to be more of like all right this is one mission kind of in a vacuum as opposed to being part of something bigger but it does sound like you have some intentions uh to do that as well um, to, to have something a little bit bigger. So that, that, I mean, that's exciting. I know B-17, the Mighty Eighth was one of the games that I was, I played a lot of, uh, when I was younger. So, um, I'm certainly looking forward to that. Uh, and, uh, you know, whatever you guys can share when you can share it, uh, I'm sure we'll be eating that up. Oh yeah. You know, we are eager to get some stuff out there, but you know, yeah, it's, uh, it's still too early. Like I said. When you had when you guys were kind of putting together B seventeen uh, this new this new sequel, um, what was kind of like the main feature that you guys decided like this is 
the main feature we want to put in this game that was different from the first game? What was kind of like, is it being able to move around the plane, or is it some other feature um, that you guys announced or maybe didn't announce that is kind of like, this is, I want to add this in this game. This is this is a must. Yeah, well, the, yeah, the, the, the thing about moving inside the aircraft and having VR was, was the thing. What we're trying to do with the idea if, is to provide you, this is obviously a game and i've been i've seen some people hearing me saying this what i'm going to say next and go well oh this is not an actual game this is more of a documentary or something like that but we we want to make the eighth as a game to be an experience right we want you to we want you to be inside the actual aircraft and you know live it as if you were part of those crews that's the thing we have a backstory we have something we we know how we want to get the player into the game and get into the mood and understand what's happening and whatnot so we have that covered so it's going to be on the single player campaign side it's going to be um, something that is story driven okay but overall we want you to finish you know when you finish a Mighty Eighth session in VR, we want you to just, you know, take a deep breath and go, wow. You know, that's, that's, that's what we want to do. That's what we want to achieve. And to be able to do that, we, had, we have to make a good game where you move around, where you can be part of any of the stations inside the B-17. You get the flak exploding. You get, you know all the cool lighting and sound and image and ev everything that will get you fully immersed in you, the experience of being a crew member of one of those bombers. So uh, I, 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 don't say if, I, I don't know if that's a feature, but that's definitely what we want to achieve. That's the goal of the Mighty Eighth for us. It's for you. If if I see someone do this, you know, just finish the session, take out the head mounted display and go, crap, <laughs> you know, sweating bullets. That's that's a good experience for me. And uh, I think our our work is done if people get that feeling at the end of a session. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> um <laughs> I only, uh, for me, I only have about two more questions for Mighty Eighth. I'll, I'll knock out on a number of them. But the one question I had, uh, and I'm sure I think Matt mentioned this in the last podcast about Microprose, was um, in World War II, there were literally thousands of planes in the air from the U.S. Air Force to, you know, um, English Air Force and German Air Force at any one time. Uh, with today's, like, modern graphics cards and modern-day processors, um, in this game, how many aircraft could we see at any one time while we're flying through the air, maybe doing like a bombing run? Um, I cannot give you an exact number, but a lot. A lot. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I can only imagine like hundreds kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, oh, I would say oh my so. God, hundreds is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if he said 20 i would be that already be pretty happy with that number yeah look it's everything can change of course we're talking about uh work in progress okay this this is a development but from what we have tried so far a lot <laughs> yes oh, i would love to have been in those uh, development meetings and just watch that happen <laughs> that would have been insane well i'm excited I, I would like. I, I'm hope. I'm hopeful to see a lot of aircraft. So, um, yeah. You won't. You, you you won't be. You won't be so happy when they start shooting at you. <laughs> That's for sure. It's, it's okay. All right. As long as it feels right before I die. Uh, <laughs> That's a good expression. <laughs> um, I know we're at like 40 minutes or so, Sean. So I think we should probably move on to the next game. All right, and uh, I'll flip over to uh, the game that you want to... Uh, I, I know the game is on your mind. Uh, sea Power. So, naval combat in the uh, in the missile age. Um, I'll actually have Matt take it over, because I know this is, I think, your favorite... I was actually going to ask if we could talk about Task Force Admiral. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, because last I heard, Sea Power <laughs> was your number one game, I think, for 2020 most anticipated game. 
I don't remember what my most anticipated game was. There's too many games that are in development. Um, uh, you know, so. but uh, I think the game I'm I'm kind of curious about is is Task Force Admiral because um, I was actually talking, and this was before you guys had announced that it was uh, that it was a mat- or a, a microprose game. Um, and I was talking with uh, with the developer and sort of talking about how you know I was really into microprose games when I was younger. Uh, I had just downloaded, uh, I think it was Task Force 1942, which was like mm-hmm. an old. They have a very old version of it that you can download on Steam. Um, and I was like, hey, this looks a lot like like in some ways anyway what 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 you guys are trying to do with Task Force Admiral. And um, the developer sent me a picture of like his whole disc set of. Uh, of the same game, the original like floppy disks that he had from the game that, that he had laying out. So obviously it seemed like there's, there's some crossover there, but Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about task force Admiral. Um, I don't know if I have any specific questions about it other than, you know, what do you, do you have anything that you can share around, you know, we've seen a lot with the models, right? They've shown a six M two zeros. They've shown wildcats. They've shown ships and other things like that. And I know they're going for more of a scenario base uh, approach. Uh, I believe mm-hmm. that's what they've said anyway. But can yep. you share anything about like what that gaming experience should look like? Like, if you were to give me a thirty thousand foot elevator pitch on why I should be excited about Task Force Admiral, I'll just let you do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, how, how to pitch it? How to pitch it? Well, um, it's uh, it's 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 not it's not easy. Let me tell you. Um, because there there are so many things in this game that it really excites me that it's it's, it's kind of hard not to give away a lot of the things uh, while doing this pitch. But it, it, the game basically puts in the position of an admiral, someone that has um, a task force. Uh, in this case, uh, a task force with some aircraft carriers, and you'll be doing some scenarios and missions um, based on the on World War II um, events. Uh, and although you all, you are not required, you can actually um, order units on their own. But the overall game, you well, I, I would say that you know we we tend to say that when you do this, when you when you actually order the units and make them move around, this is kind of like the easiest way of playing the game. Um, because the hardest one, on the one that we want people to actually play, is the one in which you are um, coordinating your forces and commanding your forces through other in-game characters, through other guys, through other r- ranks in the navy. So you are you are you are in control of the overall scope of war of the battlefield, and they will be the ones directing, if you can say so, the actual units and perform the actions that you want to perform. One of the cool things, and one of the coolest things for me in the game, one of the things that I'm more curious about, and it actually stresses me out, to be honest, but it stresses me out in a good sense, is the fact that you won't, in in a lot of occasions, you won't be able to have a God's eye view of what's happening because you are limited to the technology that existed back then. So, for example, yeah. So, for example, if you order um, a strike, a strike force, uh, an aircraft strike force, uh, an, air- an aircraft wing, to go radio silent, they will go radio silent. You will have no idea where they are, right? So, if you if you send them off to attack um, some ships or a position on an island or something like that, and you tell them, okay. You guys are going to take off and attack this position, and then you are going to fly on this direction, and at 1,600 hours, we are going to meet at this position. But you're going to fly this you know, under radio silence. You will have no idea what will happen until you, know, until you are on that, on that spot that you told them that you would be with your aircraft carrier, at sixteen hundred hours, if you miss if you miss that the timeline, your guys are probably going to have to ditch on the water or something like that. Or you can be or you can be there, and no aircraft will pop up because they were all shut down, for example. 
but you have no idea what happened, right? You just know, yeah, guys are not here. So you will have the same feeling, the same pressure, the same stress that admirals had back in, back in World War II when the technology was so limited that you, you, a lot of the times you would have no idea where your units would be. Oh, that's, that's exciting to hear. I know, like, so I think one of the things that I am most interested in in games right now is games that present you with challenges based off limited information and limited control. You know, we've had games with, like, God's Eye Control and Command for forever. Um, yeah. But there's not a ton of war games out there that really put the shackles on you in a way that, like, a historical commander would have. So I think that's that's pretty that's pretty exciting to hear. I know um, that's one of the really appealing things. I think of it's not a naval game, but there's a game called Scourge of War, where like the idea is you're one individual within a within a larger civil war battle or whatever, and so you you issue orders to your command, but the the rest of the battle goes on around you. So yeah. I think that's a it's it sounds like a similar concept, although perhaps uh, maybe a little bit more advanced. So that's that's pretty exciting to hear. Yeah, that's. In a nutshell, I would say it's yeah, it's pretty similar. It's pretty similar. Yeah. Will this game be like sandbox? Will we like since we're like going to be the admiral? Can we tell like two task forces to go to instead of Midway to Wake Island instead? Like, will we kind of develop the war throughout 1942 uh, ourselves? Yeah, um, yeah, I would. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I don't have all the details about that to be honest with you. But I would say yeah. Wow. Um. Now, the other thing that caught me about the game is when I was uh, looking at the trailer uh, was, besides the amazing graphics, uh, and I do have a question about the graphics uh, after uh, this one, but um, I noticed there's night, uh, there was a night battle going on. It was maybe like one or two seconds. So are we going to be seeing night battles in Task Force Admiral? Oh, yeah, definitely. You're going to see night and day cycles. So that's... Yeah, that that's just some, that's a bit more to add to the chaos, <laughs> right? Of, <laughs> I don't know where they are, and it's night times. So I can <laughs> so I can I can live out the critics. I can I can do what the critics said Spruance should have done in various battles and kept his his carriers running towards surface surface fleets and see what happens in the night. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be fun. <laughs> um, I I have a question about so. And this isn't necessarily just about Task Force Admiral, but I think you know we cover a lot of a lot of strategy games and a lot of war games on our podcast, obviously. Uh, and I think one of the things that you constantly see in a lot of these kind of games is a limitation in some of the production values or the graphics. Now, some of the game design it doesn't always make sense, right? Like the graphics in Civ are nice, but. I don't know that it really matters that you've got really high fidelity graphics on a top down game like that. Um, but I've noticed that it seems like most of the games that you guys have announced uh, are, are pretty up there in terms of, you know, if you were looking at other games of a similar genre and a similar type, um, everything you've announced anyway, looks, looks a lot better um, than pretty much most of the similar types of games. And I, and I'm wondering if that's like a, is there a philosophy around the kind of games that you guys are are trying to go with or trying to launch where you're trying to say, like, listen, you know, we're trying to make strategy games, but they need to look like modern games as opposed to maybe something out of, like, 1995? Um, I, I wouldn't say that's the philosophy, and that may not actually be totally true. Just look at Second Front, for example. The graphics are very good, but it's not lifelike graphics, right? Although they are... They are stylized and uh, they are different from the other games, but uh, a lot of people argue and say that you know it's not. They are not nice graphics. I disagree, um, I, but I, I wouldn't say it's a philosophy. It, it is a philosophy of Microprose to release games that are well done and polished and pleasant to look at and have nice graphics. But we were just lucky to find developers that are very worried about the the graphical the graphic aspect or the you know the I won't say the eye candy but the visual part of of the game as well because the people will want to a lot of people will want to do check out the battles 
from from a closer range, right? These guys are doing are doing amazing work on the AI and on com and on, on air combat and ballistics and stuff like that. You know, the other day the guys at Ride Dog uh, released a small um, screenshot or even a small video. I think it was a small video of uh, an aircraft shooting uh, another one in front, and the bullets just hit that aircraft and went through and hit the other aircraft behind it. So. There's there are there are a lot of details that are being added to the game, on other uh, on any other aspects. So why not do it on the visual side as well? And some of these games are you know like F Task Force Admiral, are planned to have some more other things in the future via DLCs, where the visual aspect will matter a bit more. I cannot say exactly what, but something something else is planned for for some of these games that if, even if it, if it weren't these guys are very proud of what they do and they are working very hard to make these games not just fun but very very pleasant to to look at and you can zoom in and you can even do some some videos if you want to and tell your own story through video editing and whatnot and i'm sure that will happen for sure Wait, are you saying that we will be able to fly B-17s on first person off of the Task Force Admiral carriers? <laughs> no, <laughs> That'd be a short flight. I think it, I think it it would be a bit hard to take off from a B-17, um, you know, from an aircraft carrier. <laughs> yeah, what did they do with, it with the Doolittle raids? What was that? Uh, the B-25. B it was a twenty. Yeah, it yeah. was a twenty-five. Scrapped up. You know, they almost. I think the the last the last thing they are going they were going to take to bring the weight down was the engines, <laughs> <laughs> just to make it lighter. <laughs> so since I saw all the graphics in Task Force Admiral and uh, and Sea Power, this this will also apply to Sea Power, and the graphics are just absolutely incredible. I mean, this is stuff that you probably can use in a movie. Um, the question I got for you, and I know this probably doesn't affect Matt. Uh, and I, I'm not sure which one Tortuga has, but what kind of graphics card are we going to need <laughs> for, for a game like this? I have a mid-range graphics card, uh, AMD 570X. And I yeah, think... I think, yeah, it'll be okay. I think it'll be okay. It's not it's not that hard, that okay. intensive on, on computers, to be honest. Oh, okay, that's great. Okay, I was worried there for a second. I saw this beautiful, uh, you know, all these this incredible trail, and I'm like, damn, my, how's that going to work for me? <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think it would make any sense to develop a strategy game and and then have you no know, only have the high hand users with the amazing rigs get to play it. You know, I have a medium range computer as well, so I'm I'm a good I'm a good benchmark inside Microprose. And of course, we have a lot of different computers, and we have a guy with a a GTX 970 or something like that. Or I have another we have another guy with you know. Uh, a laptop with a GTX 660M, something like that. Wow. So, I'm not saying it will work on those computers, but we have all sorts of, you know, of course we have all sorts of different machines to test to set to test stuff up. And um, our goal is not to do high-end games in the sense that you know guys with average computers will won't be able to play the game. That's that's not the goal. So you'll you'll be fine. Um, now, I, if I can. Toss us over to second front. I feel like it's the least focused on game title that you guys have uh, announced so far. Yeah, it's kind of like snuck under the radar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it is, and it's a, it's such a cool game. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah, people are not paying enough attention, in my opinion. I think it's it's just a graphics thing, right? I, that it's not quite as flashy. It's very hard to make a a, a super movie like yeah. trailer, as I've seen for both yeah. um, Task Force Admiral and the what was the uh, Sea Power one. I, I want to call it Cold Waters because it's the Cold Waters team, but <laughs> yeah, it's it's, the same, it's one of the same guys. Yeah, it's the lead developer for Cold Waters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, those they can really sell themselves just by their graphics, but you know, Micropose was built on extremely good gameplay, so that's I'm sure that those will also have good gameplay. But that's why I want to direct us to at least for a moment, um, Second Front. So as far as I know, it's just it's Joe is. Uh, the developer, he's a, it's a one-man team. Um, it's it's a two. It's, it's actually two men. Well, it's a, a couple team. It's Joe and his wife. 
Oh wow! Oh wow! That's that's, that's pretty amazing. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My wife won't get anywhere near a computer. Much well, he hit, what so. can I say? He hit the jackpot. Right? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's for sure. So, anyways, I guess I would just ask the same thing we already asked you about Task Force Admiral. How would you? So, first of all, I don't know how many people who are listening to the podcast right now are familiar with uh, Advanced Squad Leader, but that's uh, this is second front is based on advanced squad leader yeah if i'm not mistaken right? yeah it is yeah uh this is a tactical game um hex based i think um but pl- can you just give us the elevator pitch for this one and then we can maybe discuss a little more yeah look when um, we, we live in an age where players are, are very visually influenced by games so i understand that a lot of guys are you know look at the trailer and look, look at the screenshots and a lot of them immediately dismiss the game. Others don't dismiss it right away, but they are skeptical. I am honest. I, I have to be honest. I was a bit skeptical myself when I first looked at the screenshots and some of the. Uh, it was it weren't actually videos, but small small animated gifs of um, of portions of the interface, etc. I wasn't super excited, honestly, when I first saw it. You know, but if if David was was um, bringing this developer in. It had to have something something special. So I started talking with Joe, and I, I, he sent me a build, and I started playing around with it. And I realized that, you know, it's <laughs> I, I love the game. I, I simply love the game. It's not the type of game that I usually see myself playing for hours, but I lose myself in the game because it's very challenging. This is a, this is a strategy game. It's a, it's, it's a tactical game. It's something that... Um, you have ob- you have you don't have big maps. The maps are quite small, like fifty by fifty ex- hexagons or something like that. Um, but you have objectives on each map. You have to have a certain number of points to actually finish the map, and you gain points from destroying other units or from capturing certain locations. You move around the map. Um, trying to trying to get the enemy not to spot you and trying to surprise them and trying to position yourself in a way that you can defeat the defeat the enemy the enemy's units so to do this you have line of sight so you can hide behind trees for example and the terrain around you is very important because it can actually protect you from from being shot at and you have several other rules that allow you to move and not being shot at and allowed to position yourself in, in ways that you can capture the enemy easier. But by easier doesn't mean it's easy because the AI that Joe is developing, which he has called Gretchen, so it's a, it's a female AI. <laughs> That's not his wife's name, is it? <laughs> Ah uh, no 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 it's not it's not you know, if it yeah if it was I think he would be divorced by now because you know <laughs> I'm not going to use to use cuss language but Gretchen is not a nice person <laughs> or a nice AI okay she is yeah she tends to be on this uh, bad mood the whole time and try to kill you your neighbors your dog and <laughs> it's it's just yeah it's, it's wait we're talking about the AI right. Yeah, the AI. Okay. Gretchen is the AI. It's, it's, he just baptized the AI Gretchen uh, for some reason. Just give him... I like that, by the way. It, I like when AIs have a nickname. It, yeah, it yeah. gives you something personal to get mad at when you lose. Yeah, and when, and when, when, it, when it just destroys, the, the, destroys mankind and you know, just captures the world, you, you know who to blame, right? It's, it, was, it was Gretchen, which is <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much what it feels like when playing when playing second front. So, uh, well, in a nutshell, I, I, I know you asked me to do this in a nutshell, and it's it's kind of hard for me to do it without trying to explain a bit more of the game. In a nutshell, it is a strategy game. It is um, turn based. It has a lot of complexity. It has a lot of elements that both help you destroy the enemy, but you know it also works the other way around. So. The other enemy has a chance to destroy you as well. It's not an easy game. It's very easy to un- start and understand and understand the base concepts, but it's very hard to actually master the game. And it took me, I don't know, like fifteen. Yeah, granted, I had no manual. I had to learn a lot of the things on my own, and I had to ask Joe for a lot of tips and you know, and a lot of concepts. But it took me like. I don't know, 10 to 15 tries on the easiest map 
oh, just wow. to be able to win. Yeah, granted, after that, you know, after that, things were easier because I understood those concepts. But the thing is, you know, you need to understand these concepts. It can get frustrating if we don't work on a way to introduce you to these concepts. So this is something that we're doing as well. We're getting these concepts out. We're getting you to understand what works and what not. Give you some tips, some strategies, some tricks. You know, you need to understand the environment around your units. You need to understand how you can use your units. So, for example, your units can be broken. You know, you, you can have the enemy hit you and your units just flee. They run away. And they can be broken for a given number of turns. But if you have a leader with them, or if you send a leader, which is a kind of unit, or if you send a, uni a leader to meet them, they can recover faster, right? And, they, and you can use them and get them back into action uh, quicker. So there are there's there's a lot of details. This the, the graphics look very um, very simplistic. You know, almost uh, a guy told me that the game looks goofy. Maybe <laughs> I wouldn't use that word, but yeah, maybe it does look simplistic. But it's very it's a very complex game on the background. It has a lot of things going on, and it's not going to be easy for for players to master and conquer the whole you know the whole maps and all the other units. So it's 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 something that if you are being turned. Uh, away from the game for the graphics you are losing you are, you are just skipping and you are you are missing a great game yeah, i don't think that this is like the one place i would say this this podcast um i i can speak for myself at least the games i play have far worse graphics than second front so. i still play gary grigsby <laughs> yeah. war in the pacific and i still think it's one of the greatest war games ever made so... Exactly. So you're you're among friends here. We, we, <laughs> these are all people. Who, yeah, I understand. We don't really need the, I the graphics here. I actually, I my my opinion is the graphics on on Second Front look look somewhat charming. Like I, I wouldn't call it high fidelity, right? Like I think high fidelity would be more in the vein of of Sea Power or or um, a Task Force Admiral. Uh, or potentially, you know, once we actually start seeing stuff out of out of B seventeen, I would expect it would probably be more more high end. But it's still, you know, the the key thing I think is making a game feel like it feels modern, so that you don't feel like the interface is sort of in, inscrutable. And then, you know, obviously the gameplay needs to be needs to be engaging and fun and challenging. Uh, and then the graphics just need to serve the overall design. That's my my point of view. And so certain certain types of games, you need higher-end graphics to do what you're trying to do and, and build the experience you're trying to do, but you don't need that for every type of game. I think I can speak to why somebody might even call this goofy. Um, it's just because war gamers for this type of game are not used to 3D. This is, has this really nice 3D rendered units and stuff like this, and, and it's just something that war gamers aren't used to. But what he meant by goofy is probably like, I can't believe this is <laughs> so good in 3D. But it, it is a little cartoony in the look. Um, these are all things which are probably uh, foreign to wargamers, grognards in particular. So yeah. I think the hardcore wargaming group, they're not really going to care about the graphics anyways, so you can't possibly like put them off by the graphics based on the games like THG mentioned, any kind of Gary Grigsby title or anything like that. I mean, these games are just... You can't go worse for graphics. The, 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 you, and don't get me started on the... On the GUI, which is even hey, worse. Speak for yourself, okay? <laughs> oh, it's pretty bad. <laughs> look, and, and yeah, but look, and to Joe's credit, even if it looks simple, it's not easy to create that kind of art. No, it's it's not. Well, I it's, can't it's, do it. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> it's complicated. You know, you, for you to do something that you know that it's not that complex, but it looks that good, that is a lot of work. He has put a lot of hours into it. And I, you know, after some time, again, I'm guilty of judging the book uh, by the cover when I first saw the screenshots, because I didn't understand what it was until I start. Well, it actually was until I, I started playing it. But when I started looking at the details, you know, and the little gradients and the little model, some very small details that you can find on these models that you just go, wow, you just know, it, it, it just 
did this extra little bit here, which good. You almost ignore it by looking at it the first time, but it's it's there and it's just fantastic. He has done a brilliant job. He has he still has a lot of work to do. He's working on the user interface, which is something that he wants to improve a bit more and give the user more information. But I I really love the the, the the direction of the art that he's doing, and I love I love his work. Yeah, I mean, me personally, when I first saw the game, uh, you know, when you guys first made an announcement, I saw the trailer. I was actually one of the people that really enjoyed it. I love the graphical style. You know, it kind of reminds me of when I was going over the trailer um, a couple hours ago. I was just amazed. And it kind of reminded me of, like, Fortnite meets Combat Mission, you know? And... It, it, it just it has that nice appeal to it uh, because it's like it's not heavily graphic, but it's as uh, as uh, engaging as combat mission from the trailer that I saw. Can you so before we before we move on, because um, we talked a bit about the graphics and I know you've given us a little bit of an overview of the gameplay. Is this like a I haven't played really advanced squad leader. I know you said it was somewhat modeled on that. Is this just strictly speaking like a scenario game where it's like you've got a list of scenarios, I want to play X, Y, Z, and I go and I play it? Or is it a campaign where you play through the through the course of, of the war? Or, or can you talk a little bit about like what's the experience that the player is going to have as they play it? Yeah, you can have you, you can have a, a whole different of, of experiences, honestly. You can Joe's working on a campaign. Uh, you can play different scenarios, just you know, um, lose scenarios, lose maps, if you say so. You also have a map editor, so you can actually build your own maps. You can share your own maps with other guys as well. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a fully sandbox experience, but you can go from one end, where you have a campaign with several missions you need to play one, other the, uh, one after the other, to the other end, which is, you know, can create your own stuff and do your own missions and create or your own maps and play your own creations. So you have a great variety of things you can do. Yeah, and the scenario editor, by the way, looks amazing. And it's no surprise. He actually, prior to this, I think he had a standalone product, which was just to build scenarios or something like this. So it, I'm sure that the scenario editor is going to be top notch. It is. It's it's really it's really cool. Uh, we, he has a version on the build already. He is building the missions using the editor, so he's actually using the tool that he's shipping with with the game, uh, so that you know folks can folks can enjoy it and make their own missions and make their own scenery. So, um, but yeah, Joe started by developing this piece of software to build scenarios, and he's basically making a game out of it. One question I have about the second front is, as soon as I saw the trailer, I was thinking, I was like, in my head, I'm like, is this game going to be PBEM, play by email? Because as soon as this game comes out, it was the first thing I had on my mind. <laughs> I thought about it as well, but that, I don't think that's on Joe's plan. Oh, okay. But I can, I can totally see how, yeah, I imagine the same thing. I imagine the same thing, you know, kind of like have a, a multiplayer environment in which you know you are actually playing with another person. Yeah, I just have to have my friend uh, come on uh, play at the same time. <laughs> We're just doing PPM <laughs> all the time. Yeah. So, Sea Power is uh, one of the uh, games that you guys announced uh, when you first um, when when you guys first announced the reformation of Microprose. One of the things that I caught from the page was the lead designer of Sea Power is uh, from Cold Waters, the original game that uh, came out is ready on Steam. Um, I'm kind of curious, it, it, will this game be similar to the way Cold Waters plays, or will this be different somehow? Hmm. Uh, I th it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of similar with a few tweaks, uh, I would say. Um, I'm, I'm, I, would, I, don't want, I don't want to go into any specific details at this moment. I cannot go into any details to be honest with you right now but it's it's a bit of a mix okay is it uh, gonna be like campaign or is it a more sandbox like to, uh, like you mentioned with task force admiral it does have a campaign i believe it also has um, a mission editor i'm not 100 percent sure on that so please don't quote me on that but the main the main aspect of the game is tweeted. to have a 
<laughs> oh, well, let, let me retweet. Oh, crap. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's uh, the main scope is to play the campaign, and you'll be able to play lose missions as well. So, I I got the feel that that would just be something that's a little bit like Jane's uh, fleet command. Is it? Uh, do you know if that's an accurate assessment of it, or is it going to be a, a little more one ship at a time? Uh, yeah, it will be a lot like Jane's fleet command as well. Yes. Oh, okay. That's really interesting to me because I think Cold Waters was obviously this game where it's like you're commanding one submarine against the world, basically. Um, And it was a very interesting sort of campaign that unfolded, but it was always just from the point of view of your one ship. Graphically, it seems like the game certainly is using a similar interface anyway, or a similar engine, uh, because it looks very similar to Cold Waters. But it'll it'll be really interesting to see how the game design changes when you're no longer just a sub-skipper and now you're you're commanding a fleet. I think the Jane's fleet command is a nice comparison, uh, Tortuga, because it, that's when when you look at the screens and then you say you're commanding a fleet, you, that's I think where your mind instantly goes. Um, I'm really curious to see how how the game experience changes though, because obviously the interface and what you're doing is very different when you're commanding multiple ships and you're no longer just a sub trying to evade and sink uh, and only in charge of one thing really. Yeah, because you won't be you won't be micromanaging the ships so so much, right? You're you're the, the the I think yeah the assessment of of the game being more towards Jane's fleet commander it's, it's probably more accurate than saying it's more like cold waters. So you're not going to be micromanaging things as much. You'll be you'll be managing the fleet. You'll be managing the aircraft. You'll be managing the whole the whole battle the whole battleground not just one ship right that's uh, that's a really good thing because i don't know if you play cold waters but oh my god to to, to do torpedo <laughs> evasion is just nuts I, I can't do it barely with one submarine much less try to do that kind of evasion with multiple ships yeah at the same time. yeah yeah no yeah yeah it's it's yeah it's uh it would be crazy <laughs> it would be crazy. That's why I said, you know, it's it's kind of a mix because I know there are some management elements in um for in, in, in ships and aircraft and whatnot, but it's not you're not micromanaging every little bit. You're pretty much ordering them to do something more like fleet command, yeah. I'm actually really excited about uh sea power, um because first of all I th- I've all, I've loved the previous games from these people, I know that there was, you know, some kind of break in the team of Killer Fish, but I really liked uh, Cold Waters, and then Jane's Fleet Command is is just iconic. Obviously, it's just a great game that plenty of people have tried to remake. I mean, the most recent one we have that's just similar, I guess, is Command Modern Operations. But this seems to be, I mean, obviously much more graphically interesting, and uh, probably a little more tactical, a little more. Well, I don't know. I I can't compare them until I have I play both, just like you with the VR headsets. So. But I, I really am looking forward to this one because uh, there's not a whole lot of Cold War games out there. Um, and I just feel like every time we get a Cold War game, I don't know why. I just, I love that, that era. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, I, I understand you. I get you. Look, this, this, this is actually a curious story because um, I think, yeah, Task Force Admiral was signed pretty much at the same time that Sea Power was, but a bit before. And I was looking at at Task Force Admiral, and um, I was I was checking, you know, some some images and some videos, and I was going like, oh man, you know, it would be really cool if someone came up with a with um, a Cold War, you know, Jane's Fleet Command kind of game, and I I went and I said, oh, look, David, you know. It would be really cool if someone came up with a game like this, and David just went, "Oh, I just signed that game." <laughs> <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> this guy seems like uh, I, I, I don't know David, but he sounds like 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 in, like the Steve Jobs of the strategy gaming industry. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, he it was just, these incredible games. Yeah, no, no, I know. No, sorry, you. We signed Task Task Force Admiral, and one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but uh, so uh, yeah, just to say that I really relate because I I felt the need of 
I, I do feel the need of, of a game of this of this time of this era, uh, which again, not to use the the word in a way of a love story, it also has this romantic side. You know, the Cold War was is, has a romantic side to it in terms of history and uh, you know how this stress and pressure and this this cloud um, over the world and these two forces that were just you know um getting into each other's uh, under each other's skin and the cool thing is that you know in sea power you will be able to play both on the blue and red force oh. so you can play for both sides oh wow that's really cool when you said james fleet command i was like i was so hoping you were gonna say that <laughs> i love that game growing up i, I poured so many hours in that so since you, we've been talking about all these incredible games and uh, just shedding more light on this, um, and you said there was numerous more games, like double digits games that are still in development. Um, I'm not going to ask you what, but I do want to ask you, because Microprose is responsible for my favorite game of all time. The game that, like, if I was going to, you know, go on a desert island and I only had one game to bring, it was going to be Star Trek Birth of the Federation. And <laughs> this IP is in dire need of strategy games or any type of game that can be, you know, put out because Star Trek's getting a resurgence with all the uh, Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard and uh, I think there's like two or three other series that have been announced. Is it out of the realm of possibility that you guys might bring in an, I, an IP uh, like Star Trek or maybe a, uh, another IP, uh, but mainly Star Trek? <laughs> hmm. Well, this... Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see this question coming. <laughs> uh, um, a little bit far afield of the other games that they've taken on so far, at least. Yeah. Well, here, here's the thing, and uh, this this may seem like one of those canned responses, you know, th those responses that you just give away because, you know, it's, it's, the, it's a polite and correct thing to say. But um, in all honesty, we are looking at a different, a whole different set of IPs and former IPs from Microprose. We don't own them all. We don't have all the former IPs. Some of them are with other companies because they were sold back in, back in the days when, when Microprose was being ghosted. Or was, you know, for lack of a better expression, um, but not. I'm not going to mention that that IP in particular, but we are looking at several old IPs to bring back to um, to you know to 2020 plus 20 to the 20s, <laughs> or you know to the to the modern age of microprose. So yeah, we are looking Falcon into a lot 5. of that. Falcon 5.0, Falcon 5.0. I don't want to steal your thunder if this is uh, actually in the works, but it would be kind of interesting to get the the cold water team just to move on to Silent Service three <laughs> <laughs> or Star Trek. Uh, Silent Service was like one of the. I, I just have, I mean, nostalgia watching my dad play that game and yeah, getting so nervous as a little kid when the depth charges started falling and you know anyway, it's a the, yeah. But that is exciting to hear. I mean, I guess I do have one somewhat related question, although it's not specific. And and if you can't answer it, that's fine. But, you know, Microprose is known for a lot of simulation games. There's a lot of games in there that were like flight sims or war game type stuff. Um, but they were also involved in a lot of non-war games as well. Um, so I guess I'd be curious to say, like, is this... Is this iteration of Microprose really leaning in heavily on the military side of things, or might we see non-military focused games as well? Didn't this new Microprose, as you put it, it's it's really leaning toward more of the war game side of things. But we are not excluding other games either. We're just not. It's not like we are act internally. We're not actively looking into other types of games right now. It doesn't mean that we're not going to later on because let's be honest, we have a limited amount of things we can do at the same time or within the next few years. Um, internally, I think most, if not all, of the next games from Microprose will be 
military slash war games. But that doesn't mean that we cannot find or we will not find some, some developers outside of Microprose that can bring good games into the company that we will publish it. I know of at least one title, and that's one title that's being developed by an external team, which recently became very um, attached to Microprose or very close to Microprose for a series of reasons. And we will, we will talk about those reasons uh, sometime soon because there's, there's going to be some very... I'm very excited about some of the things that are happening and that started happening very recently at, inside Microprose with other companies as well. Uh, but there's at least one title that, although it may later on go towards the military, the most military or the military area, war game area, it's not, the initial iteration is not actually war game. So we're open to pretty much all kinds or most kinds of games if they are interesting and if they you know they are in the spirit of what we want microprose to be although we are focusing on war games it's not uh, it's it's not like we want to make microprose a war game only company if if there's a good game that's not a war game or a military game we will certainly look into it and if it's good enough and if we think it's it's something in the spirit of microprose a fun game something that people can relate with and can have the sense of achievement and it's just a good game, we will probably publish it. So Pizza Tycoon 2, because who doesn't <laughs> love pizza? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so I have one more question, and I know Matt and Eric are going to rag on me for this, but I'm going to ask this anyway. No, he's no. not bringing it to the Apple Store. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, I ask this uh, a lot. Um, so we need a sound you, effect when you ask this question. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> uh, Microprose has announced uh, multiple games uh, that are going to be coming out, and dozens of games uh, that are going to come out in the next couple of years. Um, the one question I have is the mobile market. I play a lot of my games, strategy games, and you know regular uh, games on my iPad or on my mobile phone. Is there any type of possibility that you guys might consider also going into the mobile market or bringing any type of games to the mobile market? Yeah, there's always that chance. We're looking at different platforms. Again, it, it seems like it sounds like a canned response, but the truth is we are open. You know, we're not just, not just open to different kinds of games. We're also diff open to different kinds of platforms. So that, that may be a possibility. It's something that, other other people have asked us, and uh, even inside we have talked briefly about it. It's not something that we're doing right now, because we do have we're building we're we're building this company pretty much from although it's a big company like we said at the beginning of the conversation, having between fifty to seventy guys working for the company, and having the external developers and whatnot. So this is this is not exactly. Uh, a startup or a couple of guys inside the van like like you said but we are building we are building this project pretty much you know even if we are building from from something that we already have like some of the old ips etc this is actually building a company pretty much from scratch so we cannot we cannot afford to just you know do everything at once and we certainly don't want to um to scatter our teams in such a way that we are unable to actually deliver what we want to deliver and actually make the games. So we are not working on those platforms at this moment, but that doesn't mean that we won't be in the future. Okay, so it's 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 open. We're not saying no. We're not saying no. And it, it's very possible that we will enter the mobile market for sure. It's very possible. So when you guys do, uh, just uh, let us know which platform to go into because I got <laughs> some of my first purchase. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, play. we will. We will. It won't be something. No, if that will happen, it won't be something that will happen uh, anytime soon. We have a lot of work ahead. We have a lot of work. We have a ton of work ahead. We have a lot of different games and we want to make them and we want to make them, you know, good games for you guys to, to enjoy it. So that's, that's our top priority. We don't want to throw games out of 
you know, on 10 different platforms just to sell as many units as you can and make a lot of money. We want to make good games first. And if those games, if we manage to get those games on other platforms, if it makes sense for the company and if it makes sense for you guys out there that, you know, you are the reason for, you know, they are the reason for us to be doing this. If it makes sense for you and us, I think we will do it. We will be, we will be doing it. Just don't expect that to happen, you know, anytime soon because there's, there's still a long way, there's still a long road ahead for us to do a lot of things and do them properly. Well, I can't think of a better way to, to wrap that up. I think that's exciting to hear. And I think, you know, all of us are, are really excited about what we're seeing so far from Microprose. By the way, my joke earlier, there was a Microprose Golf in uh, 1992-91. So I yes. was, didn't realize that. Was, wasn't there also a Pizza Tycoon? Yes, was that, that one I knew was, was a Microprose game, but I did not know they had a golf game. So, um yeah, I do. I will say one thing, and I'm I'm going to say it in closing because I don't think you can probably answer it at this time. But I know you mentioned earlier in the interview that you guys are sort of thinking about the publisher relationship differently and that you kind of have a different relationship with some of your developers uh, or some of the partners, I guess. Maybe that's a better word, uh, mm-hmm. who are developing games that are being published by Microprose than a lot of, a lot of game publishers have. And I think that would be... Again, it's probably too early right now, but I would love to see like a four years from now or something like that when you guys are, you know, you've got a bunch of games out and, and, and things are a little bit less secretive. I would really be curious to see how you guys are thinking about the model being different because you're not the first person I've heard say that, by the way, who have, who have said that like your publisher developer relationship is different. And I'm really curious what that means. I think I'm always one of the kind of guys who's really interested when when companies can peel back the the onion a little bit on how they how they operate or philosophically how they think about things. You know, whether it's like a a piece by someone like Rob Zachney or some other like you know someone better than me at doing those kind of like investigative pieces. But that's really interesting to see and honestly exciting because I think anytime you do things differently. Uh, I think that's that's always a chance to move things in the right direction and, and kind of maybe find find a way to do things that people didn't think of in the past. Um, but I'm curious to know what that means. So hopefully that's something you guys might be able to shed in an interview with someone at some point in the future when you're ready to share. Yeah, very probably, yeah. Not right now, though. <laughs> well, so, Joe, for my own part, I'll just uh, wrap by saying thanks for joining us. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. You're very well spoken, so I guess you're apparently very good at your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, thank you. So thank you for your time. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me here, guys. And uh, it was a blast. I had a ton of, of fun. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, it was a pleasure being able to answer to most of them, actually. So <laughs> that was good. Thank you very much. And, um, well, keep doing what you're doing, guys. I, I love your podcast. And I'm, I, I, can't, I can't wait to see the reactions to this episode. Thank you for joining us. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast to get the latest notifications about future episodes. And if you have a spare couple of minutes, be sure to leave a review of this episode on the podcast app. Thank you. And we'll see you in the next one. By the way, I'm drinking uh, the champagne of beers again tonight. Nice. High life. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's only because uh, it's so cheap. <laughs>